Hear the word of God from John chapter 14, verses 27 through 31. These readings come from the New Revised Standard Version, and you can find them in the Pew Bible on page 877. <clears throat> peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. The word of God for the world. Thanks be to God. Well, Jesus must have been on Red Bull or something. <laughs> he must have been drinking some kind of caffeinated energy drink. That's the only explanation I have for how long he spoke on and on and on in this particular passage in John's Gospel. I can't imagine doing it myself. I mean, I, I preach three times on a Sunday morning, 20 minutes long, and I'm exhausted. But here's Jesus, John chapter 13 to 16. It's three and a half chapters long, 150 verses, the, the longest, most inter, uninterrupted collection of sayings that Jesus ever offers in the entire gospel, longer, longer than even the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, the only crazier thing for Jesus to try to do would be to preach six straight times on Christmas Eve. I mean, <laughs> only a fool would try something like that. And frankly, it doesn't come at a better time. This is a critical time for Jesus to be speaking at length in private with his disciples because it is just hours before his arrest and his death that Jesus wants to upload to the disciples the thing that he wants them to hear the most, his final set of instructions and encouragement to them before he dies. And, and this is what he says. If I, were to, if I were to boil down all 150 verses from John 13 to 16, I think these five verses that Mary Lou just read for us pretty well summarizes the entirety of what he wanted to tell them. And in fact, I'll go one step further. Of those five verses, I think there is one word, just one word, that pretty much summarizes everything he wanted his disciples to hear in that critical moment, and that word is peace. Peace. That's what he wanted those disciples to hear. And frankly, I think for many of us here in the sanctuary or worshiping online, I think that's the word we need to hear on many different levels in many different ways. Many of us are craving peace in our lives, in our relationships, and certainly in the entire world. In fact, here's an interesting bit of trivia. In John's gospel, what is the last thing that Jesus says to his disciples before he parts from them? before his arrest, in private with his disciples, comes to us from John chapter 16, verse 33. This is what he says. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have, over, I have conquered the world. It's the last thing he says to his disciples. I want you to have peace. Now, it might seem a little strange to you that here we are talking about a story from the end of Jesus' life, just as we are preparing on this third Sunday of Advent for the beginning of Jesus' life. Seems like an odd story to bring in as we're preparing for Christmas. But if you take a high-altitude view of the entire life of Jesus, if you take that camera and pan it out to the widest possible lens, what you discover is that there's a recurring connecting thread 
that ties the beginning of his life all throughout his ministry, even until the end of his life. And that recurring thread is that this world needs peace, and Jesus has come to give it to us. From the beginning all the way to the end, we discover that he was born into a world that was longing for peace. He ministered for three and a half years, time and time again, offering peace to the people that he encountered. And even today, for all of us, we are still living in a world that is craving that kind of peace. It's a recurring theme, all the way back to the birth narratives. Each of the major characters that we are introduced to in the Christmas story, if you think about it, they're all longing for peace. The very first person we're introduced to in Luke's gospel, Zechariah. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're elderly people, they are childless. And here is Zechariah, a priest doing his duties in the temple, when all of a sudden an angel interrupts his responsibilities and breaks into some amazing news that would change his life. And instead of reacting with great joy and expectation, Zechariah is troubled in his spirit, Luke says. And he is gripped with fear. Zechariah was longing for peace. Skip ahead a couple verses in the Gospel of Luke. We're next introduced to Mary. Mary, that young girl, unwed. And Gabriel interrupts her life one day. And the angel says to her, I bring you good news. You are going to give birth to the Son of God. And here's Mary, this young girl, finding out that she's pregnant. And instead of reacting with great joy and expectation, her initial reaction, according to Luke, is that she was troubled in her spirit and she was gripped with fear. Even Mary was looking for peace. And of course, you look at Matthew. Matthew wants to tell us about a guy named Joseph, Mary's fiance. The angel appears to Joseph, too. And says, hey, uh, hey, Joe, <laughs> I got some news for you. Your fiance, Mary, yeah, she's pregnant and you're not the dad. But the angel says, Joseph, hang in there. I know this is troubling news. I know you want to put her away. I know you want to subject her to the whims of the public. But don't be afraid. Even Joseph was looking for peace. And then, of course, later in the Gospel of Luke, we hear the iconic story, the great Christmas story, about some bumbling, stumbling, marginalized shepherds that were out in the fields taking care of their flock by night, and then, lo and behold, the night sky gets emblazoned with twinkling starlight of angels. And the angels appear to the shepherds, and they start singing a glorious hymn that, in fact, includes the word glory very similar to the song that you have just heard the choir and these musicians perform. And it, by the way, isn't it, isn't it great to have the choir and these musicians offering this to us today? This is wonderful. And, and in fact, I suppose the, the, the choir was even singing the song better than the angels. Yes, the choir says, all right, all right. Because when the angels sang the song, the shepherds were terrified. So (laughs) they were caught off guard. They were gripped with fear so that even the shepherds were longing for peace. Over and over and over again, we we are given evidence that Jesus was born into a world that was gripped by trouble and that was longing for peace, longing for hope, longing for shalom, shalom. That, after all, is the Hebrew word for peace, shalom. In fact, it's one of the most important words in the entire Hebrew vocabulary. We see that word shalom over and over again in the Bible. And often when we see that Hebrew word in our Bible, it is translated with the English word peace. But as is often the case in the Hebrew, There's not a single English word that captures the entirety of the definition of shalom. You know, when we think about peace, we often think about the absence of trouble, the absence of conflict, the absence of war, or some 
calm, contentment within our spirit. I mean, those are all good definitions of peace, but none of them fully capture what shalom meant. Shalom comes from the root word shalom, which means to be safe in mind, body, and being, the entirety of oneself, to be whole and complete and full, to have one's entire self be safe and secure. And so that word becomes the important word all throughout the Jewish literature, all throughout the Old Testament, and even in the time of Jesus. Jewish people back then and even today would greet people with the word shalom. And you know, when, when a Jewish person says shalom to someone, it has such deep meaning, so much deeper than when you and I greet each other. You know, when we greet each other or greet someone in the street, we say, hey, how you doing? And the other person says, fine. That is so unshalom. <laughs> shalom means so much more. It means, it means more than peace. You know, in, in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings when we invite you to turn and pass the peace of Christ, you know, you say good morning to someone. You say, hey, you look nice. I hope the sermon doesn't go too long. Go Bucks. Any of a number. I know you all say this. But shalom means I wish for you the fullness of your well-being. I desire for you the complete sense of health and prosperity for you. And then it goes one step further. To say shalom to someone means I so care about the fullness of your well-being that I am willing to offer myself the completeness and fullness of me in order to have you experience the fullness of your life. That's shalom. And for 150 verses, for three and a half chapters, the very last thing that Jesus wanted his disciples to hear is the one thing he wanted everyone to hear since the beginning of his life, shalom. I want you, created people, children of God, to be whole, complete, and full. I want you to feel safe in your mind, in your body, and your being. That is what Jesus came to give us. But you know, he goes one step further. He goes one step further than that. In verse 27, one of the verses that Mary Lou just read for us, there is one word in verse 27 that I think is the most remarkable word in this entire passage. Here it is. Jesus says, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. That's amazing. Jesus wasn't just saying shalom. He wasn't just saying, I hope you get peace. He wasn't hoping for them some sentiment of peace or some general sense of peace. Jesus was saying, I am giving you a part of myself. I am giving you my capacity for peace. I'm giving you my ability to experience that wholeness and completeness in your life that I have demonstrated for you time and time again for these last three and a half years. Jesus was giving his disciples the most amazing gift, not just shalom, which is amazing enough, but his own divine capacity to experience it. Imagine those disciples hearing those words having witnessed everything that Jesus had done in front of them for three and a half years. This Jesus, they were on the boat with him on the Sea of Galilee when the, when the waves started kicking up and the, the wind started roaring and the storms started howling. But Jesus had this capacity for shalom. He was asleep under the deck of the boat, fast asleep, experiencing peace. And he was saying to those disciples, I am giving you that ability. When you have the storms of your life swirling around you and within you, I want you to have my abilities to have peace. Think about the times the disciples saw Jesus being pummeled by persecution in public. When his detractors, when his critics were coming after him with fiery darts and jabs, but instead of firing back at them, Jesus experienced 
and demonstrated peace. One time early in his ministry, he was doing some teaching, and the crowds pressed in on him, and they were going to kill him. They were going to take him by the shoulders and toss him. But Jesus experienced peace, enabling him to walk straight through that crowd full of critics. And he was saying to his disciples, you can do that too. I'm giving you that ability. To the point where even when he was hanging on a cross, he could find it within himself to say to those tormentors, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus was giving him that ability. Even in the face of death, even in the face of mortality, like when Jesus looked at the daughter of a man named Jairus and with a single word summoned her back to life. When he looked at the grave of his dear friend Lazarus and with a word called Lazarus into new life. And even in his own tomb, he was able to rise up above death itself and conquer the grave. And he was saying to his disciples, for any of you who are grieving the loss of loved ones, for any of you who are facing this upcoming Christmas Eve for the first time without your loved one at your side, for any of you who are fighting debilitating health diagnoses and wondering how much time you have left, Jesus is saying to his disciples even today, I am giving you an ability to have shalom even in the face of your own mortality. And think about this. With this group of 12 disciples, this this ragtag, motley bunch of diverse disciples that represented the full diversity that you can imagine, even political diversity. Matthew being a conservative and Peter being a liberal and the other disciples, everything in between. Jesus was able to take this community that would otherwise be polarized and practice peace with them to where he could unite all of them past their differences, past their ideological barriers, and say, all of us together are important for advancing the mission of God's love. And that ability for Jesus to break past all of the ideological divisions is the same shalom that Jesus wants to give you and me in a broken world. That is exactly what Jesus was saying to his disciples. And Jesus wants to give that shalom to you. Now, I know that's hard to hear. I know that for many of us this morning here or watching online, the ability to find peace may be the farthest thing from your abilities right now. You may come into this place feeling like you can't at all experience peace with everything going on in your life and in your relationships and certainly with the headlines around the world. In fact, you might wake up every single morning and look at yourself in the mirror and you see in that image staring back at you ample evidence of the lack of peace in your life with the wrinkles and the furrows on your brow that speak of the internal turmoil that you carry day in and day out or the look in your eyes that reminds you of all of the worry and anxiety that you have been facing and still confronts you in the future, or the frown on your face that is as gravitationally pulled as the spirit dragging you down into the the dirt. All of that may be counter evidence to the possibility of peace, but this is the word that Jesus wanted the disciples to hear and wants you to hear on this third Sunday of Advent. Shalom is possible because of what Jesus has done for you. You have been reconciled with God. You have been set free and forgiven. And now you can experience that shalom for yourself. In fact, I would leave you with three practical points. Surprise, surprise. Three practical points. Number one, seek shalom in yourself. Number two, Seek shalom in your relationships with other people. And number three, work together to create shalom in the world. Number one, it starts with the shalom within you. I love this quote by the 20th century uh, British poet, Max Ehrman. He says, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. In the noisy confusion of life, 
keep peace in your soul. You can do that. God has given you that ability. Jesus is offering his peace to you so that maybe for the first time in a long time, you can be at peace with yourself. You can be gentle with yourself. That includes all the shame, all the guilt, all the addictions, all the anger. That includes all of the anxiety, all of the worry, everything that is weighing you down day after day. You can experience shalom with yourself because you've been set free by Jesus and are in a full relationship with God. And after that, you can take the next step. Only after being at shalom with yourself can you be at shalom with another person, including and especially the person with whom you are in conflict, the person that's hurt you, the person that you've hurt, especially that person. You can look that person in the face and instead of seeing an adversary, instead of seeing an object to spar with, you can actually see a fellow child of God. You can see in their eyes the look of Jesus looking back at you. And you can practice reconciliation with them through the hard work of forgiveness, both seeking their forgiveness and asking their forgiveness. That is a hallmark of the Christian life. It is a hallmark of shalom. And it is only possible to be at shalom with someone else if, first of all, you're at peace with yourself. But then, after those two things, peace within you and peace with others, that's when the real fun begins. Because now, together, in restored relationships with others, we can work on the world. Number three, seek shalom in this whole broken world. That's the task of the people of God. Not to keep shalom to ourselves, but to work for the advancement of God's kingdom all around the world, everywhere that it's broken. Every single broken relationship. Every single relationship that's broken between us and this planet as we seek together to be environmental stewards of this whole created order, as we seek together to be in full relationship with the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized, as we seek together to find justice for all of those who are oppressed. In the Bible, in the Hebrew language, peace and justice are not different concepts. They are related. They are one and the same. They are both sides of the same coin. In the Hebrew mindset, you cannot have peace without seeking justice, and you cannot achieve justice without seeking peace. And you cannot have either of those until you reconcile your relationship with those with whom you're in conflict, which begins with you experiencing peace in yourself. One final bit of trivia. You know, if, if the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples before he died was a word about peace? What do you suppose is the first thing that Jesus said to his disciples after the resurrection? When he joined them in a private meeting in that room after he was raised from the dead, what do you suppose he said? John chapter 20, verse 19. Surprise, surprise. He says, peace, peace, be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Surprise, surprise. Jesus was still talking about peace. It's almost like he picked up the conversation right where he left off three days earlier. He said, peace, then he went off and died, rose from the grave, said to the disciples, and said, hey there, guys. So anyway, as I was saying about peace, <laughs> same conversation, same message, same Jesus, same peace. And so for any of us, who are on the brink of Christmas Eve once again, longing for a peace that passes understanding, receive this message from Jesus. Shalom. Shalom 
in you. Shalom from you. Shalom for the world. Peace be with you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this message of Jesus that is hard to hear, but one that we crave. We know that we live in a world and that we live lives that are broken and hurting. And we thank you for offering to us the gift of yourself, a message of peace and hope for each of us. Help us to receive that gift. Help us to be that peace and help us to share it with others. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and that all God's people say, amen. We receive from you now your gifts, your offerings, your prayer cards, and receive from this splendid collection of musicians the second and third movements of this beautiful rendition of one of the earliest Christian hymns. As the choir sings and as the musicians play, our hope is that the spirit of peace would fill your hearts and that you would breathe in the gift of peace through this gift of music. Will the ushers please come forward?